Welcome to the Creative Plane Podcast Network. Join us as we review our favorite RPGs, collectible card games, MMOs, video games, PC games, and bring up interesting topics and things that we'd like to share with everyone. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the 5th Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Hey guys, Jim here from Creative Plane Podcast Network, and I've got a great guest on the show today. I've got Neil from Scion 2.0. Hey, Neil. Hey, uh, thank you for having me on the podcast, Jim. You're very welcome, man. Uh, Scion 2nd you know, Edition, the Kickstarter's going full swing. We've got about 15 days left on it, and it's going gangbuster. Yeah, we passed, two, we passed $200,000. It's a big milestone for us, and I am really, really happy and really pleased with the amount of attention and the enthusiasm a lot of the backers have towards it so far. Yeah, it's 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 nice seeing the, because uh, of course we've got the Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok podcast, but it's good to see with this Kickstarter just how many Scion fans are still out there that are you know, that are jumping in and joining in on this Kickstarter. Absolutely. There's a lot of new fans who are really uh, jumping in on it, too. People who didn't either didn't get into Scion a first edition or who are just seeing the concept for the first time. And they're like, whoa. And um, I've heard a lot of people actually come up to me and say, you know, this is kind of a really unique idea and a really uh, original concept. And uh, there's, there's a lot of other good games, like very good games, in fact, that allow you to play um, heroes or descendants of gods or whatnot. It's a very common trope, um, but there are no real games that do that in our modern world and that deal with real gods. Exactly. So. That, that, that urban fantasy blend that, that has the modern legends and pulling from the historical legends, but you're actually that, have that beautiful modern day spin. So yeah. for anybody that slept under a rock, what is Scion? Scion is a game about mythology and the reason why people have People, why people worship gods. Um, Scion is a game where you play a descendant or a chosen one of a god, an actual god, uh, from one of several pantheons, like the Greek gods or the Norse gods or the Japanese gods, for example. Um, and you take on the role of a hero in, this, in our world, in our modern-day world, um, where you, uh, you go around, you basically do labors like a lot of the heroes of old. Uh, you fight the Titans, who are the enemies of your parents, uh, and you sort of work to grow your own legend so that you, too, can kind of become a god. Well, not kind of, so that you, too, can actually become a god. Um, the books being kickstarted right now for Scion 2nd Edition are Scion Origin, which details the base setting, the base system, and a lot of the... Um, <clears throat> a lot of the base level stuff, and then Hero, which is all about actually playing these heroes. And together, they're meant to be sort of a dual core book uh, going forward. Um, more books will follow in the series, like Demigod and God, actually about climbing those heights of power until you eventually become uh, a god on the same level as your parents. Yeah, that's definitely one thing I, I really appreciated when the, the first edition of Zion came out was the way they progressed the three books. It was hero was all self-contained, but it really needed a little something extra, you know, which I definitely think Origins is going to cover. So that way, for those GMs out there that need just a little, little more, give me details. <laughs> sure. Uh, anything, you, anything specific you want to know, or? Um, for one, I know in first edition the battle wheel. How is that changing in second edition? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know that's going to be a big one. Uh, tick combat is is, is uh, an old favorite of a lot of people's, but we decided to go in a different direction in second edition. Um, initiative in second edition is handled through a variant of what's generally known as popcorn initiative, and that is 
basically when you roll, everyone records their results and it creates a roster. Uh, but instead of, uh, instead of, you know, Neil, Neil rolls a five, Jim rolls a three, the enemies roll a four. So it goes Neil, enemies, Jim. Um, you basically create a roster that says PC, NPC, PC. And so either you or I could go um, in one of those slots, depending on which of, which of us, the players, just, you know, wants to have their characters go at that time. And in what it, this really does is it encourages a lot of teamwork at the table, and it encourages people trying to think about time, not just positioning and not just the battlefield situation, but time in a uh, tactical sense. Um, so that you're like, well... You know, I want the big guy to go and probably try to take out a bunch of enemies uh, before the mooks hit. Or uh, if you have a bunch of powers that are very good at taking out crowds or a field of mooks, you're like, okay, you go first. So they will definitely be uh, entangled, and then everyone else can kind of get a bunch of free hits in on them. That's sort of the way. That's sort of the way we want to go about it. That's what it was designed to do, and it's made a really big impact in a lot of playtest sessions. The playtesters are really enjoying it. Yeah, that's that's a, and a few other games that I've played that use that style of initiative. I'm a huge fan of it as a as a game master because that yeah. way it really does get conversations at the table up. Okay, I'll go for the setup and you go for the takedown. You know, so it gets it gets the group playing like a cohesive team. Absolutely, Scion's really built to have that kind of cohesive team feel. It's meant to definitely feel like you're in a band of heroes. There's a couple of modes of play in Scion Second Edition. Uh, there's we have a really neat system for handling downtime and for handling solo adventures. For example, if you're if there's a player who can't quite make it to the to the session, um, or if there's uh, if 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 you can only have one player at the session, uh, you can run sort of solo adventures in the background or side adventures um, that uh, allow you to progress your story. Because if you look at mythology, a lot of times you'll have these heroes sort of adventuring off on their own and then they'll get together in a group for a really big adventure and then uh, they go back off on their own. And we wanted a way to reflect that in-game uh, without necessarily breaking up the action or making uh, the group split apart and ignore the other players. And I think we've come up with some really cool ideas about how to do that that are going to be really, really awesome to see and play. Um <laughs> But then, of course, you have the, you, the the centerpiece is still the big group adventure, which is basically um, uh, in, in development. We call it Argonaut level play, but that's not what we're going to call it in <laughs> the actual book. But that's, that's the story of the Argonauts. It's a bunch of heroes going off to get the Golden Fleets. It's a perfect so, example. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's one thing uh, with our group. We've always had issues with you know getting everybody on the same day in the same time with 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 Scion because that would be cool being able to peel off and have mini adventures that don't disrupt the flow of the big story. Yes, <laughs> I, th I certainly think so. And Scion really is one of those games that you can, you know, you can have a blast having a single hero with, with the storyteller just going off with having one mission, you know, because they're, especially the, the tail end of hero when they become so powerful. Yeah. Um, we definitely have a way to um, plateau, for lack of a better word, at hero. You kind of you stop you, you you I don't want to say you stop advancing because you never really stop advancing, but you advance slowly, and you're really more shifting your traits to what's important and what's not, rather than just adding more dots on your sheet. We I know a lot of people really liked playing a hero, and a lot of people liked playing at demigod, and some people didn't like playing at god, um, and there were some setting reasons why they they didn't want to kind of continue on in first edition. And in second edition, those setting reasons are really turned up to sort of 11. Um, at the hero level, you kind of have uh, the best of both worlds. You're still very, very mortal. Uh, what? Um, well, you're a fan of uh, of uh, Elia Mercad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the whole sacred profane dichotomy. Mm -hmm. You have you have um, this this godliness, this hierophany, uh, all around you that you can kind of really enjoy on a spiritual level. But you're also very deeply immersed in the profane world, and you're deeply in, in you know you're deeply immersed in these um, mundane pleasures, for lack of a better term. Exactly. Uh, mon monsters aren't you know knocking down your door every single day. When you become a demigod, for better or worse, you're starting to really change the world, and you're starting to really warp things around the things you, you do. 
and you'll find yourself going off into foreign lands more and more often. Whereas before you could kind of visit and enjoy their pleasures, you know, now you'll be bound to them by quests and you'll be, you'll have to go there and do things. And, um, there, there is a plateau at demigod, but very few reach it. Most demigods either end up dying horribly or they end up, uh, apothesizing into gods and god level play is going to be something very different than it was in first edition you're still going to be able to adventure around and do things but a lot of the play is actually kind of looking over the mortal world and looking over uh the group of people you bound yourself to with your pantheon and spinning off incarnations of yourself uh, that can exist at the same time that you do and well you know do things and have their own little adventures and have their own little lives a lot of Scions are actually um, uh, descendants of of incarnations of gods, um, if that makes sense. And gods can have different incarnations. So even if you're a scion of Thor, you can meet an incarnation of Thor that isn't actually necessarily your dad. He is and he isn't, in a way. The whole avatar aspect. Yes, yeah, something like that. We we decided to change the name because Avatar is actually exactly uh, it, it's 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 actually a religious term, and so yeah. we wanted to avoid that. But that's that's awesome. I mean, that's one thing I know. Like with our group, they were terrified when in one of our first unpodcasted games they got to God level, and I'm telling them that they can just you tell me what you do. You have that power, and they just got terrified of the the fluidity of what they had access to. We, one of the big things in second edition is that we, we know that um, Scion's a lot about making a big difference in the world uh, and having the world make a big difference on you. And I think one of the, one of the issues a lot of people had with first, first edition is that there wasn't a lot of guidance in terms of what you could do and what you were supposed to do in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so we wanted to give people guidance. We, we didn't want to give people shackles saying, well, this is what you're going to do. Uh, but we wanted to say these are the sorts of things you could do. And in a lot of ways, the, the signature characters now reflect that as good sig- signature characters for any kind of role-playing do. Um, these are things that you can do, uh, not necessarily things that you must do. That's good. Yeah. So uh, now I've I've gotten lucky. I've gotten onto drive uh, drive through RPG and checked out the uh, teaser that you've got the preview. For yes. those who have not heard the story path system, what is it? The story path system is a brand new system designed for uh, Scion and Trinity and designed to meet the needs of both games. Um, it is very heavily based on the storyteller and storytelling systems. Uh, more so the latter, although it takes some concepts from the former, um, that that powered the classic World of Darkness and New World of Darkness, now Chronicles of Darkness games. Um, we, it, it's been in design for a while, almost uh, almost four years now. Yep. Um, it, it actually had a couple of very rough starts and a couple of. Um, uh, a couple of rough starts and a couple of uh, restructuring. Yes, restructurings. It went through a number of iterations, going back and forth. Um, sorry, just one second. Um, yes. So we designed it, and um, uh, I eventually became lead developer over it um, after a number of things, and I decided to scrap a lot of the previous things and kind of rework a lot of concepts that we had. And what we come up is very cool. So it's still a, a D10 system. It's still, uh, you roll successes on a target number on, on a D10. Uh, it's still an attribute plus skill system. Uh, but what we've done is we've, we've really streamlined and um, put um, definitions in the, hand of the hands of the players in a way that those other games um, don't or just decide to go in a different re- direction. For example... Uh, in uh, storytelling and storytelling, you have you know your backgrounds and your merits and those sorts of things. Uh, in story path, those are those and a lot of your relationships are all tied into this one thing called the path. And you have a couple of paths to start with, but what they are are phrases or sort of descriptions of your character that you can kind of cue off of in the system. 
and um, uh, to just kind of spontaneously generate something that might be worthwhile to your character. For example, um, you could be uh, the scion of a forgotten ninja clan, and that's that's your path, the scion of a forgotten ninja clan. Um, you could be walking down the street, and you could get attacked, and you could actually, for um, benefits in character, you could say, well, actually, the attacker is from one of the rival ninja clans, and that sort of thing. And you will get benefits to your character and bonuses uh, because you tapped into that piece of the story. What paths are meant to do are ground your character and kind of make characters really make players really want to grind their characters down into the into the setting itself and want to engage the setting on a very personal level that's important to their character. Uh, every, I think everyone's had the story about the character who's just a, you know a lone wanderer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just I'm just a random badass. I don't have any anything to tie me to anywhere. Well, you know in reality. Those lone badasses uh, know the highways pretty well, and they end up knowing, um, you know, which places, which diners are good to eat on long roads, that sort of thing. They're even a drifter has connections somewhere, and they have knowledge, and they have ties to things. And so, if you really want to play that character, I'm not going to say no. Um, but the way our system is designed, the way the paths are designed, you kind of have to spell out what your connection to the setting is. So that character. Uh, may not have any personal relationships with anyone, uh, but they're going to have a very deep relationship with, say, um, uh, the you know the highway system, or they'll know every nook and cranny of like every little city here. And actually, probably that that scion will be very well along their way to becoming a god of journeys, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so already you're seeing how it kind of ties into the setting and into the system. Yeah, and as a storyteller, it's it's a beautiful system because that way it's it's reinforcing your characters in the story. It's right, and it, it also signals to the GM, or we call them the story guide and story path. It signals to the story, the story guide, what do my players want to see, what do they want to do. So, you know, just give the people what they want. Exactly, and, and hey, we all know from being a story guide, you know how difficult that can be sometimes of what do my players want, you know? Are they wanting to just shoot down paper targets? Or are they wanting, you know, some intrigue? Or are they wanting that, that non-stop knockdown fight? You know, it's it's it's, it's hard to yep. get cues back sometimes. Which, yeah. Which any game system that helps reinforce that is always a good thing. I absolutely agree. So with with Scion 2.0, what's what's one of the aspects that you absolutely are intrigued and in love with? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of them. Um, I could talk about uh, purviews and how we still have the bo the boons from first edition, but now there's a free form aspect to your your purviews called Marvels that you can kind of you can kind of just sort of spin off. I could talk about the big changes we made to fate and the whole concept and the con and the way you do fate binding. That's what I'm curious um, about because I, I was a okay. fan of using fate binding. I okay. used it a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, some people use it a lot, and actually, as the rules were written, you were supposed to use it a lot, um, especially as things went on. But we found that there were a couple of conceptual difficulties people had with them, and as we were researching a lot of pantheons, um, the ancestry of first edition's fate. In this sort of um, the sort of Greco Norse uh, conception became very apparent to everyone mm -hmm. because it, fate doesn't quite work that way for uh, every for every pantheon. So we we kind of I don't want to say we scrapped first edition's concept of fate, but we're like, what is fate supposed to do, and what is it supposed to be? And every once in a while, you'd have little you'd have little inconsistencies and that actually happens over the course of any edition of a line. If you look at any kind of role playing game, um, you'll see that the longer it goes on, the more inconsistencies with core concepts crop up. True. Um, too many pe people <laughs> picking at the tapestry. Yeah. Lots of different writers have slightly different ideas and maybe a different developer comes on and wants to take it the line in a different direction. And that's actually fine. It's the way lines grow mm -hmm. and it's the way that, Bad ideas kind of get get minimized, and good ideas get reinforced as the line goes on. So we tried to drill down on what fate was supposed to be. What fate's ultimately supposed to be is a, a web of relationships, and it's supposed to be um, 
a reinforcing of your character's natural affinities towards things and natural attributes. And ultimately, it's also a way to make consequences matter because you can't just throw out your power willy-nilly without expecting it. If you live by the sword, you will eventually die by the sword, that sort of thing. So we're like, how can we make, a, how can we make fate both uh, a web of relationships and we can make it a sort of reinforcing of what you're supposed to be doing? The consequences to fate don't really come in at the hero level. And that's another reason you really might want to stay hero. At the hero level, there's all kind of minor benefits. So uh, they're, they're tied into your callings, which are your archetypal expressions as um, a, a, a scion. You have three of them to start with. Um, I think I think um, one of our playtest characters is literally named generic Irish uh, scion, and his callings are um, sage, lover, and warrior. Because that's what all the Irish gods sort of uh, um, aspire to be, is mm -hmm. that sort of archetype. <laughs> so generic <laughs> generic Irish scion, um, whenever uh, he uses some of his power, whenever he um, does something that reinforces this archetypal expression, fate will sort of search out and select uh, a fate binding that's appropriate to him uh, or um, – engineer a situation that is appropriate for him to be in. For example, um, in first edition, fate kind of overrode uh, the personality of a, of a nearby mortal. It kind of um, mm. turned them into something they weren't sometimes. Like, you could have a best friend, and fate's like, I'm going to make you a nemesis instead. And, well, that's that's a cool idea to start with, but it doesn't really work a lot of times. It, 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 just, it just doesn't... Yeah, it requires storyline work to actually justify... Yeah. So part of what you do in generating your path and part of what you do in generating that um, those side mission stories is you work on a web of relationships and you work on people you know. Uh, and it's some of it is based on a system called the Ladder from Vampire the Requiem um, that generated touchstones for your vampires. But uh, what it does is basically um, when, you, when you make a fate binding roll, you look at the callings you have and each calling has a number of fate bindings associated with it. And that latches on to one of your web of relationships from your callings and from your paths. And that generates um, a fate binding. So fate doesn't really um, mind control anyone. It's more like a really good search engine. So if you're a lover and you have a fate binding of the paramour, uh, fate will find someone that you would already be attracted to and who would be attracted to you. And then we'll engineer a meet cute. Like you will be in Trafalgar Square and there'll be a very light drizzle coming down, just enough to have a little rainbow in the sky. And you two will bump into one another and you'll spill your papers and she'll spill hers and you'll mix them up and have to call each other at your respective places of work in order to work it out. And then, you know, there'll be a coffee shop right by where you guys decide to meet and you'll be very thirsty. That sort of thing. That's why that that fate is more like a really big cheerleader. It's like, yes, do this, do this trope. Yes, do this plot. And you can ignore it if you really want to. Um, but it's sort of stuff you're inclined to do anyway. So why would you? Yeah. Um, and it will reinforce things that you do. You'll find yourself more and more in those types of situations. Uh, it's not until demigod and God, that you know, the teeth and the knives come out when you start going against fate. Uh, but that does eventually happen. But that's, that's so. with Scion, I mean, fate's one of the important driving factors because that's the whole reason why the gods aren't constantly meddling. It's it's why they have to take a handoff approach. More or less. Yeah. Um, and why they why they spin off incarnation is to have stuff that's very similar to what they'd normally be experiencing, but so they can kind of experience it without a lot of mythic import. Also, as you rise in legend, the things that you do tend to have very big resonating effects. Um, your callings can change and that actually changes a lot of the nature of your divinity and it changes a lot of the power that you derive from what's called your mantle or your kind of divine oversoul. Um, because a, a god isn't just a god, they're also the idea of that god. And so by doing things that sort of go against this archetype that you've built for yourself, this image of the god that you are, um, you can cause a lot of like loss of power, you can cause... Um, uh, a, a fraying of it, a change. 
Um, when gods want to make a change to themselves, really, they have to make a new mantle. And this also explains why certain gods have different identities. Um, mm. Ares is a very bloodthirsty and fierce warrior god, but he eventually matures into a sort of a god of civility and also a bit of the god of the harvest uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the form of Mars. Um, and so in this game, they are, they are different mantles. They're the same god, but think of it as, I mean, everyone wears different hats. Like at your place of work, you, you have a different demeanor and a different role than you do when hanging out with your friends or that you do hanging out with your parents. Um, in Scion, when a god does that, uh, it's, it's a radical change in their personality. That, that does help fill things out of, you know, how exactly it gets translated by just the mere mortals. Yep. Besides, you know, sometimes a god actually has to throw on another hat because of a godlike situation going on. Yep. Absolutely. It's like uh, we jo we joked in one of our early games when one of uh, my wife's character, she basically, you know, it was the mission with the Raven Cloak where you get to steal your parents' power. Uh, yeah. She was a scion of Freya. All she knew when she put on the cloak and spent her legend is she, I told her she heard a woman screaming when the lightning hit her and she she blasted with power. First thing her libertine character did was make the world's biggest party in Las Vegas. Mm. And all of a sudden, uh, she realized she found the rival group that was against them and basically murdered the two evil members of their party in <laughs> ways that could not be brought back to life because healing was one of her things, and she purposely wanted to make sure they could not be resurrected. And you know, like I told her, honey, I can always bring them back. I got ways. But when she got in trouble, since she was from the, the, the Norse pantheon, uh, basically, uh, the two gods that were slighted demanded a wear guild of her for killing their children. You know, you 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 had godlike power. You smited a child. You need to change channels for your character. And basically, uh, the the Isis demanded she become a priestess for her, and she had to actually represent Isis, which was really really against her her natural grain. Oh, that's that's pretty cool, and it actually ties on one into one of the big things that we're really stressing with Scion Second Edition. And that the Titan War isn't in the background. If anything, it's a little more fierce, but it's also much more varied. Um, it's no longer the Titans are laying siege to each of your divine realms, because that cuts you off from a lot of cool locations, I always felt. Mm -hmm. Like you couldn't really ride down the Bifrost and, and visit Valhalla. And that's actually one of the cool things about being Norse, is that you should be able to do that. Um, and actually the Titans themselves have also really radically changed in concept. Um, so in this, in this edition, the Titan War is really more of a cold war, if that makes sense. And it's um, two, you know, kind of very big superpowers of divinity sort of staring at each other warily and having little proxy wars battling out across the globe and, and you know, acting through deniable actors like, you know, your scions. Uh, in addition, this opens it up to a lot of intra-pantheon rivalries and inner-pantheon rivalries. So you have Loki acting against the rest of the Norse pantheon, or you have um, the Theoi and the Yazata and the Devas all kind of hate one another very, very hard. Um, actually, that's sort of like the archetypal example of, uh, uh, you know, pantheons who are nearly at war with each other rather than fighting the Titans. Exactly. Um, and there are some pantheons where the Titans are, I don't want to say friendly, but... Uh, they have a, a you know a good relationship. Like a lot of the Greek titans are sealed away, but some of their titans are actually pretty friendly, and they actually interact with them. For example, uh, Helios lives on Olympus, and he's a titan. But the big thing about it is that being a titan isn't necessarily evil. It's just being so consumed with your purview, so consumed with this aspect of the world that you embody that they they don't have any empathy and they don't have any understanding of mortality. Even a lot of jerk gods are very understanding of, of humanity, and they have a really deep connection to them. They just, you know, they're, they're just jerks about it. But the, the Titans, it's not that they don't care, it's that they don't understand. They're unable to fundamentally grasp what being human is. Yeah, empathy is an alien concept. Yeah, essentially. Um, so if you went to visit Helios, you'd be like, he'd be like, "Hey, how's it going?" And you'd be screaming, and your flesh would be blasted from your bones, and your bones would be bleached because he's the sun, mm -hmm. and he's just blasting out, you know, sun energy 
uh, at a thousand times greater than the actual sun itself. So, and he'll shrug and he'll move on with his day. And he is the day. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that's, that's really the big thing about Titans is that many, many of them aren't evil. Many of them aren't necessarily cruel, although some of them are. Surtur, for example, uh, mm -hmm. the Lord of Muspelheim, or Mikaboshi, the uh, August Lord of, uh, of the North Star, um, they're both pretty evil. Uh, um, they're, they're, hey, their jobs were written down, and that's what they got to do. <laughs> basically, um, or uh, Apep, for example, in, in Egyptian mythology. Apep's mm -hmm. the titan. Um, so, or any, any, of the, any of the creatures in Norse mythology, for example. That, those are... So, uh, it's not that they're necessarily evil a lot of time. Like Fenris, for example, is a titan who isn't necessarily evil, but he has to be bound, and he has to be, be, have to be locked away, and he can't be allowed to roam free. Um, it's, it's one of those greater goods, because they, they're primordial forces. It's, it's, it's nothing against them, it's just what they are. Yeah, it is, and uh, they don't like that. And the smarter ones start to scheme and their energies still leak into the world and cults will form around their energies, uh, deliberately kind of inculcating them for power. Like, um, if you're Norse, you might have to deal with some, you know, Ophidian snake cults. And uh, the more Ophidian energy you absorb, uh, you start growing larger and larger, that sort of thing. Um, Norse, the Norse battle a lot of giants. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the Titan dichotomy isn't entirely you know uh it, like i said it's not the same in every pantheon the irish have a very nasty habit of sleeping with their their primor their uh mm -hmm. titans um <laughs> because if you look at their history with the fomorians there's a lot of sex going on mm -hmm. um well that's yeah and actually you, you fight and then you make out afterwards you know yeah and the fomorians themselves um consider themselves to be the rightful divinities of Ireland. And they call themselves the uh, Tuatha de Domnan, the, um, the sons of the god Domnan, and, um, or the people of the god Domnan, ra rather, uh, rather than the people of the goddess Danio, which is the Tuatha de Danann. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this, you have this you know, group of rival gods, basically, uh, who are evil, but yes, then you have the devas who use the term titan as a political term. If, they're, if you're a god they don't like, they'll call you asura. Ooh. Um, and then you have the yazaras, also known as the asuras, who call gods they don't like deves or devas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they, they, they hate each other. They hate each other really, really hard. Uh, System-wise, being a titan means you have diff a different set of virtues, but... Yeah, there's a lot going on politically in the world of Scion. So that's one and, of the ones that, that I love that you can grasp into that, you know, that style of gameplay. Yeah, we, we really wanted you to have, if you want to have a deep political game that involves a lot of mythology, you absolutely can do it. If you want to have an, a rollicking action game, easy, easy to do. So we wanted to support a number of different play styles in the line immediately, and that meant really diversifying the setting itself. Nothing against first edition, but first edition was always meant to be uh, three books. It was only ever meant to be those three, mm -hmm. and it was only because it was so phenomenally successful that it was ever that they ever wanted to do any more. Exactly. Uh, but if you only ever have three books, you kind of have to have a laser-like focus on what you're doing. And we want Scion to be dozens of books, dozens and dozens. So yeah, that means that we have to have a play style and a setting that supports those dozens and dozens of books. Yeah, and Origins is definitely one of those books that was, was needed for the series because, I mean, I know our group, we just ad hoc a bunch of stuff and threw stuff together, but a lot of folks would come up to me and they're like, I have no ideas. I'm like, dude, the whole point of Scion is look at the legends that are out there and make modern interpretations of. Yeah. You know? And Origins, I think, is definitely going to help a lot of, uh, of, of new storytellers you know, get that, you know, get the point across of this is what the world's like. Absolutely. We have a number of different play styles uh, going into it, and we also have um, uh, a breakdown of a hero's journey, not the hero's journey like in Campbell, but mm -hmm. um, a long breakdown of tropes, especially at the, the early mythic level, 
and how you can sort of um, break it apart in different story pieces and story segments and what your players should be doing at each part of the story segment. So I think that's actually one of the coolest things that we've done is we really break down what what a myth cycle looks like and what mythic tropes look like. And like if you if you meet two brothers, you're going to eventually meet a third, that sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, unless they're twins. If they're twins, you won't meet a third. But if they're not twins and you meet tw- two brothers, you must meet a third. Um, <laughs> that sort of thing. Is we have a lot of those little tropes broken down for story guy to sort of pick up and drop into their game really easily. So that's, and just going to – yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of those things that makes people's life a lot easier is that we can just, you know, get, get permission basically for your storylines. Absolutely. So one one thing I was noticing was the stump mechanic. How's that changing between uh, first edition and second edition? So first edition stump mechanic was based on Exalted's, uh, specifically Exalted second edition's stump mechanic. And for those of you who didn't play Exalted second edition, uh, what it basically was was um, you would be encouraged to uh, narrate your action ahead of time. Like instead of saying uh, I hit him with my axe, you say screaming with fury. I plant my feet into the soft loam. I twist my body in a massive overhand blow uh, to split him from head to crown. And this was really cool. Uh, and you would get extra dice for it. You'd probably get that's easily a two-dice stunt. I I, I'd at least give you two dice for that one. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, and you, you, there are certain mechanical rewards attached to that. Like you'd get extra stuff back, that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the two dice were the main thing. Uh, and Scion uh, adapted this, but I always had a couple problems with the stunt mechanic. Uh, chiefly, people would describe an action, and they describe it as really cool, um, but then they'd roll the dice and they'd whiff anyway. And so instead of splitting him from head to crown, I would plant my, da- my axe right in that rich loam beside him. And a lot of times people got really, really tired of just trying to narrate it every time. And the way Exalted 2nd Edition, the way Exalted 1st Edition worked, uh, and during certain parts of high-level play, you had to stunt, otherwise you were, you were done. Oh, you yeah, were boned. Yeah. yeah. There were some events. You, you ha- if you weren't doing a two-stunt, you weren't succeeding at anything. Yeah, basically. So we wanted to change that a little bit. So how the stunt mechanic works is it's actually built on su- successes you roll past your difficulty. So we have a static difficulty, and that's the number of successes you need to roll to succeed. So if you're at a difficulty three task, which is actually pretty difficult, you need to roll three successes. And if you do, you succeed completely at your task. But if you roll four or five successes, you can actually introduce narrative details that have little mechanical effects that help you along. Um, You can basically narrate what's going on, and you can change little details in the setting or the scene to help your characters move on. Um, You can shoot the bad guys... And then if you do it really well, you can narrate that behind them, your bullets uh, have actually struck oil oil drums, and now oil's leaking on the floor, making them you know, hard to traverse, basically. That sort of thing. Um, it's a way to sort of reward people for rolling really well and to encourage them to modify the setting and the scene and make it their own through narration. Yeah, and that's 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 always important is to to it, it again reinforces that whole reinforcing the character in the story world. So that way they can right. keep interjecting more into the story world, which you know, at no point is that a bad thing. No. We also have um, a similar mechanic on the back end called um complications and consolations. Complications basically add on to um the the difficulty of a role. And they pop out as consolations um, if you're doing them on the front end, if you're going into a roll. So if you have an abnormally high difficulty for something and the players don't succeed, you can offer them what's called a consolation. And a consolation, a flat failure as a consolation will get you momentum, which is sort of a bank of, of, a bank of, 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 of um, points that you can spend to get extra dice on things and really pump up your pools a lot. Oh, that's uh, cool. Or you can take a consolation... Uh, which is basically a, a failing forward mechanic. It says, well, you succeed, but this negative thing happens. Well, yes, you, uh, got the, you, you got the window open on the skyscraper, but you triggered the silent alarm. 
and the cops are going to be here in five minutes. Yes, you got over the barbed wire fence, but you've injured your leg, that sort of thing. Or you left some critical piece of evidence behind. Now they'll be able to track you, that sort of thing. And you can you can choose not to accept the com you know the consolation. Uh, when they're inflicted on someone else via power or something, it's called a complication uh, instead. And it gets, it gets sort of tacked onto the basic difficulty of it. But when you're just doing it from the front end, it's just added right into the difficulty. And if you don't succeed in that, then it pops out as a consolation. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and I love game mechanics that, that provide that fail forward because then people will take that chance. Because a lot of times folks are, are you know, they, they're not sure what to do. And they're afraid of, of, you know, failing and then putting the group behind. In this th- this case, it's it's literally either way something good's coming out of it. Yes, absolutely. Because you know, at least make a decision and do something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because even you know, even even bad consequence is still pulling the story forward, which is you know, one of the things that I always love in, in role playing games is. Even if you roll bad, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It just means the story is taking a different direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we wanted to both uh, allow players to sort of control their journey through the game and really make it a narrative story, which is part of the reason why you're not just a storyteller. You're a story guide in this game. Uh, you're, you're helping to guide the way the story along, but it's really more of a collaborative experience. Yeah. Uh, but also, we wanted to reward players for rolling really well and mechanize the gambler's fallacy, which means that you know if you keep rolling badly, eventually you have to roll well. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, actually, um, if you keep rolling badly, you will build up momentum, and then you can just throw a giant handful of dice. Nice. So, yeah, uh, we in this edition we. Um, Rolling big handfuls of dice gets boring after a while. It really does. Um, there's very, f- yeah, like late Especially, day, my god, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's very few effects that, um, there's very few effects that uh, up your dice pools at all, except for momentum, and momentum is really the big one because we wanted dice pools to remain largely static, so we can do things to change target numbers and that sort of thing. When you blow momentum on something, you're you're directly adding dice, and that's a big, big, big thing in terms of how many successes you can generate. And so your dice pools are generally pretty static, anywhere from like three to ten or so. You're rolling dice just constantly, constantly, constantly. When you blow momentum, you can add up to twelve dice to something, oh, and that's just wow. insane. That's that's your big handful of rolling dice. I found that people enjoy that every once in a while, but don't want to do it all the time. And that's a way we kind of kind of make everyone happy. Yeah, so that way it's there so. when you have you're at that spot where you're you're at the very beginning of a story and you you know you've done a few things and you don't want to fail at this one step, you can go for it. Yeah. So uh, one thing I've noticed with the new uh, Scion stuff is the artwork is fantastic. Is there is there any shout outs for any of the artists you guys are using for this or? Uh, you'd have to ask you'd have to ask Mike about that, and I'm sure Mike would be willing to talk about a lot of the new artists. Um, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll try to do a blog update with a lot of the new artists we are um, really showing off. If you guys want to know more about Scion, um, I do do occasionally do blog posts on the Onyx Path blog mm-hmm. at theonyxpath.com. Oh, I know. So. Over the last uh, what, three or four years, I've been watching those posts, you know, hoping for one notice <laughs> saying there will be a Kickstarter coming soon. And trust me, the, the first day I knew at least 20 people that jumped on it right off the bat. I'm really glad because we're really excited to see Scion back in, back in press. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in regards to the game, is there any is there any meta plot besides the Titans that you can actually talk about? Or, um, I wouldn't call it a meta plot precisely uh, because a meta plot. So, what a meta plot is, and I actually had to drill down on this when I developed Beckett's Jihad Diary, which is the big book o vampire meta plot. <laughs> um, and I, so, I had to ask myself, what is a meta plot? And a metaplot is basically um, a plot that continues through successive books in a line uh, that are done by signature characters who are not your own and can have an impact on your own game. Like, for example, um, uh, the Vampire the Requiem books have a continue. Some have this like little tiny B plots going on in the background with signature characters, but it ne- it'll never really impact your game. So it's not really truly a metaplot. Whereas um, 
if you know the Ravnos antediluvian dies in Vampire the Masquerade, that's probably going to affect a lot of what you're at your game, even if you have no Ravnos players. If the Camarilla takes um, a, a new city in the south, that's probably also going to affect your game, at least kind of tangentially. Mm-hmm. So there, there, there are plots going on in the background of Scion, and there are a couple of little hidden mysteries kind of sprinkled throughout the books that we hint at and we like people to kind of pick up on and piece together. It's much more in the vein of the Chronicles of Darkness than it is in the vein of the uh, classic World of Darkness. But uh, there are some meta meta plotty things going on, and there are some deep bad things going on. Like, uh, to kind of give you a hint at one of the more obvious things going on, um, the Keepers of the World were one of my absolute favorite antagonist groups from <laughs> first edition. Mm-hmm. And for those who don't remember him, it was a number of gods led by Imhotep and Hercules um, <laughs> who were basically like, we really do not like our pantheons. We really don't like our parents. We think this whole divinity thing is bullshit. And mankind would be better off without the gods at all. And so they are actually working to, to sort of separate and partition off uh, the world from the rest of the pantheons. And um, we have a mechanic in second edition that actually really helps with that. And um, uh, the keepers have a good chance at actually making their making their their evil plan come to fruition. I mean, if you can call it just a really deeply humanistic plan um, uh, evil, mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, they have, they have, pl- <laughs> yeah, they have, they have a big plan and it will probably require warring against every other pantheon, uh, but they have a plan. Um, so that's, that's a sort of meta plotty thing we have going on. There's a few other things, uh, that I like to drop and I definitely do not mind dropping things about pantheons who are not immediately featured in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and may never be featured in different books, but. Um, in first edition, you had the you know the Welsh pantheon show up a couple times yeah. and get mentioned, and um, but they never they were never really detailed. Um, I do really want to detail them, by the way, because there's another <laughs> there is another metaplotty thing that involves the Welsh pantheon that you can probably guess if you're very conversant in Welsh mythology and the greatest hero of Welsh mythology. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but there's definitely some scion uh, fodder there. Big yeah, guy. I definitely think so. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, th- that's that's a very big meta plotty thing kind of going on Scion as a side plot. And if I get my druthers, I will dedicate a full a full book to that that one plot. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah, I think so too. So on the goals, I'm actually pulling it back up. Uh, I do recall hearing something about the Scion jumpstart rules. Any uh, idea on what the ETA would, for that would be? Because I know that's going to generate a ton of interest in Scion. Oh, um, well, I'm polishing up the core books now. And actually, the jumpstart rules are probably something that I am going to start almost immediately on. Um, the, the the two stretch goals I want out soonest are uh, Jumpstart and probably Nemeton Devos, uh, the, the Gaulish nice. Pantheon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the, the dead Gaulish Pantheon, I should say. Because most of them are quite dead. Um, so what happens when you lose too many, you know, believers? Yeah. Um, well, no. Um, gods and Scion don't uh, aren't they aren't dependent on faith uh, to be created or to um, to survive. Like they don't they don't need prayer to to keep eating. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't need prayer to keep their power. Um, but Prayer and their relationships to mortals acts as a kind of as a kind of very big fate binding, and you can cause someone to radically change what what they think, and that changes your power. Like I said, um, Loki is kind of stuck being the god of lies, and if he tries to be something else, um, either people aren't going to let him change, and his fate bindings are always going to be the same. Mm-hmm. He's always going to be stuck in this god of lies thing, or worse. He'll do something really radical, and they'll start thinking something very poorly of him, and then then his his powers will actually start to change, and his personality will actually start to change. And um, this is actually um, happening in Scion uh, as a sort of ongoing thing. So the Orisha, the Yoruban gods, um, were a lot of the gods of 
uh, of of Africa, and um, even in, in in modern religion, in um, uh, in, in modern religions that that worship the Orisha, and um, you have this sort of um, mythological backplot of uh, the transatlantic stra- slave trade as changing the gods mm-hmm. itself. And I thought, well, this would be really cool uh, if we did this in the game. And so the the Orisha sort of looked at their followers and looked at them suffering and looked at that, and they were like, well, we can stay in Africa where we know where we are, or we can stick by our followers and change in ways that might be uncertain, but will always be with those we worship. And they chose to change. And um, they have suffered and warped as a result of that, as their people did. And uh, the they have a sort of sub pantheon that's offshooting from them, and that's the Loa. Like those those gods are slightly different than the Orisha, um, but th- th- those that would be detailed in um, another stretch goal that's already been achieved. Yep, yep. Uh, but to get back to your to get back to your <laughs> original question, the jumpstart I really want to be um, get people involved, get people knowing the basic rules, get people enjoying Scion, and as a guide to new players about how to play. Mm-hmm. So that's really what we were going with with a lot of the jump starts. It's worked out really well in a lot of other games. Um, our C- our uh, creative director, Rich Thomas, prefers the term jump start because uh, instead of a quick start, it's like, oh, yeah, it's quick and then it's over. Uh, he wants you to sort of like jump into the game and be able to like really assist people in getting to know what's going on. And so it's a slightly different terminology that's, uh, an inkling of the change in um, the change of philosophy behind it. Mm-hmm. And trust me, I mean the the original sound one. I used the, the the quick rules to basically every new player I ever had. We played that 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 mini campaign, and immediately we were able to get back to a game and play with those people. Immediately they Abs- knew exactly what they needed to do. Absolutely, and that's really the best way a quick start or jump start should work. Yeah, that way they get to, to test out their t- characters, see if they like it, figure out the basic rules of what they yep. thought they were making is what they're actually playing, which mm-hmm. is which is always a good important one to find out of. If does the game mechanics reinforce what you're going for a concept? Which the story guide system actually really does sound like it's going to do an amazing job on that. I absolutely think so. And uh, one last quick thing I wanted to bring up is the stretch the stretch goal for the, the live action role playing. So uh, what's the plans for that, by the way? We have had a lot of companies come to us and start um, and just make pitches, even without being solicited, about um, Scion LARP rules. And we've had a lot of writers be very interested and be like, hey, how can I help? How can I do this? Um, uh, Apparently kids love the god LARPing. Um, But like I said, Scion is is a kind of unique game, and it does a few things that no other games do in terms of setting, and people really want to be invested in that. People really want to um, uh, play with that for their games. And I think that's awesome. I think that's great. So we've been in, in talks with a few different companies about what to do and how to go forward, and there's some really cool ideas coming out of those discussions. Um, and I, uh, I mean, we've already hit the stretch goal, so you guys are going to see some Scion LARP rules. That's good. And they are... Yeah, I absolutely think that they are going to be phenomenal, and I cannot wait to see them be tested. And I am not a LARP designer myself, but I have played a lot of LARPs, so I'm really happy to see them go forward. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else in a gaming group, having up just like one or two LARP sessions can actually really help play NPCs, you know, let folks yeah, know absolutely. what's going on behind ca- behind the scenes type of thing. I definitely think so, and I definitely think that um, we can tie them into the base game in a lot of different ways, like, for example, that those side stories – and those little mini quests and those little uh, solo adventures going forward. If you want to do a LARP with that, that is splendid. Yeah, that's going to be great. Mm-hmm. All right, so Neil, is there anything else you wanted to cover or bring up uh, before, before we wrap up for the night? I am really, really um, – let me give a shout-out to my team. Uh, I have a team of various different um, – uh, races and colors and creeds and faiths and uh, genders uh, and they are just absolutely phenomenal and they are really the greatest group of people I've ever worked with the greatest group of writers um, I've worked under some teams where the developer was almost dictatorial 
and I feel like I'm learning a ton about design from these people. And what's what you get when you bring a group of people who are very passionate about a project on together, um, and you sort of all let them go. And everyone on my team has played nicely with one another. Every member of my team has contributed a tremendous amount to the project, and I think you can really see their their passion and their knowledge of a lot of these um, pantheons just sort of leaking off the page. A lot of the people I've, I brought on uh, were experts, and some of whom were um, were you know conferred degrees in in uh, you know that that uh, in either comparative religion or in the study of the mythology of. Um, a certain, you know, a, a certain pantheon or a certain group of people, and their knowledge and their passion and their love of, of games is just exploding off the page. And I absolutely cannot wait for people to start, uh, for people to start really reading and digging and playing with them. We have a lot of resources if you want to expand your knowledge of uh, the pantheons in the game beyond what's just the pages we give. Uh, yeah, doing going a lot more in depth in the pantheons is something we really wanted to do with second edition. I think we really succeeded. Um, you're going to see, if you go to the Kickstarter right now, you can see the Greco-Roman god right up mm-hmm. in uh, in rough form. And later, I'll just tell you, we will be previewing the Irish gods going on. So you can really see how much we worked in, how we tried to fit it around the concept, and I think the amount of research we're doing going into the game. That's gonna be great because yeah, it's it's. I mean, for for a lot of cultures, this is some serious deep stuff that's being covered in a role playing game. And this is this is the, yeah, they're, they're, this is their religion. I mean, yeah. we we say mythology a lot, like oh, this is mythological, but uh, you know, there's a billion Hindus, man. Mm-hmm. The, and even though even though we're going with a, with a more kind of Vedic approach to the Hindu gods, these are still this is this is a living faith. Um, exactly. There's the, there's there's millions of people who practice Shinto. Um, there's a lot of pockets in China where I know some of the ancient Chinese gods are worshipped. They just put up a giant statue of their god of war, like a giant one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and of course, um, the Orishas, the Orishas are still worshipped all over the world, but especially in the Caribbean mm-hmm. and especially in Africa. And the, you know, these are living cultures, man. These are living stories. These are living gods. And it's important to approach that from a veil of fictionality. We're making it a game. And the Odin of Scion is not the you know the true Odin, mm-hmm. uh, but it's also important to be very accurate in what in what we're doing. Exactly. So and accurate and respectful and bringing people on who are parts of those cultures or who already respect them was a huge priority for me. Heck, I mean, one one thing I always appreciated was with the original Scion was so many of my players actually went and researched cultures that they're basing their characters on, and I'm like. That's that's awesome. You know, you're actually going out and learning from, you know, the game. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, thank you so much for having me on your podcast, James. Uh, you are so welcome, Neil, and thank you so much for doing Scion 2.0, man, because so, there are so many people I know looking forward to it, and it's going to be super exciting when it comes out. Great, amazing. Course, thank you so much. You're welcome, man, and, and you have a great one. You too. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening.